Hello, I am Debbie Doyle. I'm the meetings manager here at the American Historical Association. Thank you for attending History and Historians in response to COVID-19, Plagues Past and Present, which is part of the AHA colloquium series of virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us today and, looking, and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I'd like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the AHA, or if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat. A few logistical things to cover before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's Code of Professional Conduct, and I'll post the link to that in our chat. Um, all participants are muted, but you can use the Q&A function to submit questions to the presenters. We have a number of people viewing the webinar through Facebook Live. Um, those of you on Facebook Live can both can use the comments section to submit questions and the staff will pass them along to the presenters. If you would like to be part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. Finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording on YouTube soon. I will now turn the session over to the chair, Peter Baldwin. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Peter Baldwin. I have the pleasure of uh, chairing this panel on plagues past and present. I have a, a, a team of very distinguished historians, uh, specialists in various aspects of medical history. Um, whom we'll be hearing from. And the format is that each of them will have five minutes uh, to present. The panel will then have another five minutes to discuss what they've heard. And at the end of the hour or so that that will take, uh, there'll be half an hour for uh, responses to questions uh, from the audience. Now, the current pandemic um, is one that has unleashed a tsunami of material. We're sort of uh, swamped by an embarrassment of, of uh, riches. And historians have certainly been present in dealing with the uh, epidemic and trying to understand it. We know more about the 1918 Spanish flu now than we ever have before. We know that masks were worn. We know that shops were closed. We know that those cities that clamped down first suffered least in the long run in economic terms. And the question for us as a panel is, what more can we as historians add to this sort of knowledge. The challenge for this sort of panel is to see what historians can contribute to our understanding of the current pandemic. Now I have a dream team of uh, four or five discussants and I'm gonna briefly introduce them and the themes uh, they'll be touching on uh, when we get to that. But I'd like to start by way of introduction by raising two distinctions that I think are worth keeping in mind as we think about the COVID pandemic. Um, the first of these is between a distinction between contagious diseases on the one hand and transmissible diseases on the other. Transmissible diseases are ones that require some sort of specific act or behavior to convey them. The classic example, of course, are STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. And these are, from a public health point of view, the easiest to tackle because you just have to convince people to avoid the particular acts that are the problem. Now, when I say just, of course, uh, that uh, glosses over an enormously difficult task, but they are still easier to deal with than contagious diseases, which are spread indiscriminately through non-volitional acts like sneezing or even breathing in the case of COVID-19. These are much harder to contain when you don't have either a cure or some kind of medical prevention like a vaccination, and when you therefore have to rely on old fashioned means of interrupting contacts between people. Now COVID is of course, like the latter of these. It's uh, a disease um, that is made even worse because it's also spread by asymptomatic transmission so that those who carry it, the shedders don't even know that they're contagious and that they are a danger to others. So contagious transmissible diseases is the first distinction. The second set of distinction I just want to mention briefly is between the various aspects of intervening against a pandemic like the COVID pandemic. You have, first of all, the public health measures. 
you have testing, tracing, isolating, supplying PPE, quarantining, shutting the economy down and lockdown. And these sorts of public health measures were done more or less effectively in various nations. Some nations were evidently much more successful than other nations in doing so. So the public health uh, approach, the public health interventions on one hand, and then secondly, you have the economic responses to the pandemic. The unemployed need support, businesses need loans and subsidies, the economy needs stimulus financing to keep going. And this sort of intervention as well was done variously and with different degrees of intervention in different nations. Now, between the first two of these, public health on the one hand and the economic response, there's clearly a kind of trade-off. If you get the public health response right, your economic stimulus doesn't need to be as great. And we see here that the Western nations have had to respond much more forcefully and generously than has been the case in Asia, precisely because Asia got the public health a lot more right than the West has done. Life went on much more normally there and the economic interventions did not have to be as great or have not had to be up until now. And then finally, in addition to the public health response, the economic response we have in a sense what we might call the medical response, providing some kind of means in medical terms for exiting the pandemic, either through a vaccine or through a cure or through both. And here again, the approaches have been varied. Many nations that were adept public health responders have not been players at all in the medical response. And nations that made a hash of the public health response have been the major forces behind developing and paying for vaccines. So again, to keep these distinctions in mind in terms of dealing with the various national responses, I think uh, is an important sort of a, a clarification. Now, as mentioned, each of the speakers will have five minutes, the panel will have another five, and we'll have half an hour uh, at the end of it all for questions and comments uh, from the audience via the chat function. And we're going to start uh, with Greg Mittman, who comes to us from the University of Wisconsin. He works in many media, including film, and he's written on medical history and how it is inextricably tied to environmental concerns. Above all, his focus has been Africa. And he's going to be talking about trust as a foundation of public health efforts against epidemics and how the focus on finding the origin of an outbreak, in fact, distracts from attention to the more general structural determinants of pandemics. So Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thanks to Lisa Brady for organizing this session and for the AHA staff for all the work behind the scenes. Um, I, in my brief comments today, I want to offer just some comparative reflections on the 2014-16 Ebola outbreak in West Africa and that of COVID-19 to shed light on different geographies and disparate experiences in past and present outbreaks. It took a long time for the international community to respond to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Almost six months elapsed from when the Ministry of Health in Guinea reported an unidentified illness spreading in the community to the time that WHO declared the situation a public health emergency of international concern. Now, Ebola and COVID are, are quite different viruses. The number of infections and deaths due to the Ebola outbreak, 28,652 people were infected with Ebola, 11,325 deaths, seemed trivial to the current pandemic situation. But at the time, it, the Ebola outbreak was portrayed as a major international global uh, health crisis. And many of the critiques leveled against Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone in the international headlines, uh, particularly of Western news media, might now be leveled against the US in its response. So the disbelief and fear that we initially saw unfold on the ground in West Africa and the circulation of rumors and conspiracy theories are similarly playing out today in the US and elsewhere, although driven by different economic, historical, and political circumstances. Western media also criticized the lack of trust in government 
in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. And yet we see that same mistrust in government exacerbating the situation in the US right now. In Liberia, one of the real turning points in the outbreak in terms of building public trust occurred after the government imposed a quarantine on West Point, one of the poorest slums in the capital city of Monrovia. For a country that went through 14 years of civil war, the military and government were among the least trusted institutions in the public. And yet it was the military and police that imposed a court on sanitaire on West Point, riots broke out, and a young teenage boy, Shaki Kamara, was tragically shot and killed. The quarantine was soon lifted, and it was a real turning point in the outbreak, as we saw communities mobilize and take action, turning to trusted leaders, not to the military and government, but to radio DJs, musicians, local activists, and building trust at the local level well before there was a significant outpouring of international aid and support. So many of the Ebola treatment units built by the US military went unused because lo the local community response had already begun to turn the tide on the outbreak. Trust, as we know, is public health's greatest ally and in any, in, in any epidemic it is critical to know where trust does and does not reside. And I think this is where something where historians have a lot to contribute to is where trust resides in, in particular societies um, that we're familiar with. Putting the current pandemic in comparative perspective with the West Africa Ebola outbreak also draws attention to the ways in which origin stories centered on geographies of blame, a phrase introduced by Paul Farmer, and here we might include spillover stories involving wet markets or bushmeat hunting. The ways in which these reinforce racist attitudes, stigmatization and fears and divert our attention away from structural violence that have cre has created uneven and inequitable conditions of exposure, comorbidities and healthcare access within nations and across the globe. In Liberia, which had less than 100 doctors for a population of more than 4 million people at the start of the Ebola outbreak, the lack of public health infrastructure and medical capacity could be attributed not only to 14 years of civil war, but to a much longer history of neocolonialism and racial capitalism, in which American companies in particular, like Firestone, developed a racially segregated healthcare system on its Liberia rubber plantations that did little to help build medical capacity or public health infrastructure beyond its corporate enclave. And we see those same elements of structural violence, systemic racism and racial capitalism playing out today in the differential morbidity and mortality rates for African-Americans, Latinx populations and Native American populations in the US. And in the initial hotspots like meat packing plants where industrial ecologies created conditions right for the virus's spread. At the same time, the geographic spread of COVID-19 confronts Western stereotypes going back to the 18th century of Africa as a continent of disease and death, and which shaped Western narratives of the Ebola outbreak and racial stigmatization directed against West Africans. Today, we have a pandemic that so far has most impacted Europe and North America. As of yesterday, WHO reports 27 million cases in the Americas, 19 million in Europe, and just over 1.5 million for the whole of Africa. Whether that is an artifact of different testing capacities, the result of different demographic patterns, climate, effective public health interventions is unclear. It is a likely a combination of all of these. Whatever the reason, it is empowering African nations in ways that are prompting calls to decolonize global health and for greater solidarity among African nations in developing strategies responsive to local situations and in advocating for more fair, equitable, and timely allocation of COVID vaccines in Africa. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, we've got four minutes or so to discuss this. Panel, fellow panelists, do you want to take a whack? If not, so, uh, yeah, let Evelyn, please. So, Greg, I, I'm struck by uh, what you said about um, thinking about where trust does and does not reside. Uh, and, and when you said it that way, do you mean institutionally, um, in terms of the, the practitioners, uh, the policymakers? Um, what specifically were you referring to where it resides? So uh, what I was speaking there, Evelyn, is really where trust resides in the general public among different communities. Right. Obviously, it's not universal. Obviously, that's going to be very locally specific. Um, but really knowing those local communities um, and where trust lies in those local communities and finding trusted leaders in those in those local communities and developing public health responses is something I, I think is critical um, in, in any you know, kind of public health intervention. If I can participate for a moment, not just as, as chair and, and play devil's advocate, um, you know, the first reports, as I recall, of differential mortality, infection rates, and that sort of thing uh, among ethnic minorities started coming out already in April. And if anything, it seems to me that we've paid enormous amounts of attention um, to this aspect uh, of the pandemic. So. I'm, I'm sort of wondering if, if you think, you know, ha have we in fact learned something um, given that we are now, you know, painfully aware, not that we're necessarily doing what needs to be done, but at least painfully aware of the way in which uh, the sort of the social differential of the, of the pandemic's effects. Well, I know that Evelyn's going to be talking more about this, but um... Uh, you know, I would say we may be aware, but it's really having very little impact in terms of addressing those differential morbidity and mortalities. Um, so, um, you know, until those, until we see actual change, um, awareness isn't really um, doing doing much for that, right? And it's again, you know, it's 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 really addressing these kind of much larger issues of, of, of structural violence um, because they come up again and again in, in, in each epidemic and we're on, you know, it wasn't with the Ebola outbreak, it was with only in a matter of what, a year that we were on to the next epidemic, we were on to Zika. And so all the issues remain in West Africa in terms of about building, you know, public health infrastructure and capacity, the long-term economic costs, like how, how is it that epidemics end? You know, it's, we're on to the next epidemic. And yet that those enduring legacies of that Ebola outbreak are still impacting places like Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Some, some airlines like British Airways have not returned flights back to Liberia, um, which, and, and the kind of economic consequences of that uh, have had a long-term impact on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are at um, 10 minutes. So um, need to move on to the next panelist. Um, Evelyn, you, I don't think, here when I announced um, the the order of the panelists, but um, by lucky choice, um, you are next. I hope that's okay. Um, Evelyn comes. Evelyn Hammonds comes to us uh, from Harvard, and uh, he has worked on race and disease, and specifically on on typhoid in the United States. And she's going to talk also about trust in public health and the way in which the U.S. has racialized treatment of minorities and how that has contributed. Uh, to their alienation from the public health authorities and thereby undercut hopes of bringing them on board in public health efforts against uh, epidemics. Evelyn, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you also, um, Lisa, for uh, helping to organize this. And uh, following what Greg just said, um, I want to talk about the racialization of mistrust. And um, frankly, what's happening right now is that in many of the current discussions of uh, distrust of public health and medicine that focuses on the African-American communities uh, during the, this pandemic uh, is being attributed to three previous historical episodes. So the first is the surgeries that white physician James Marion Sims performed on enslaved black women without anesthesia in the 1850s. The second is the Tuskegee syphilis study where um, 600 uh, African-American men in Alabama were enrolled in a study of untreated syphilis without their consent from 1932 to 1972. And they were uh, also not provided with information about their diagnosis nor any treatment. And the third is the use of cells taken from a black woman, Henrietta Lacks, without her consent, uh, which, which, which were used to create a highly productive cell line starting in the 1950s. Now, these episodes are being read both in the media and in some scholarly venues uh, as the sources of the historical trauma experienced by African Americans uh, in their individual and collective encounters with US medicine and public health, both historically and today. And it's being argued quite seriously from the heads of the NIH all the way down to just local media outlets uh, that these historical episodes are what has led to distrust of the public health and medical system right now, as well as distrust of, of the vaccines that are now almost uh, ready to be distributed. And so what I want to emphasize as I observe uh, these conversations about mistrust, I want to speak to uh, just a couple of points. The first one being, uh, as my colleague Vanessa Northington Gamble said to me a couple of days ago, are we really interested in issues of mistrust or are we, issue, or are we want to talk about trustworthiness? Uh, what makes trust possible? And so I think what, what is occurring now, post the point that Peter made about the overwhelming emphasis on the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities of color in the US, both African-American, Latinx, and Native American, has led to a sense of what we hoped, I thought, was that people would be concerned about what the pandemic has revealed. And that's the social disparities, the structural racism, the institutional racism that has disproportionately uh, shaped the experience of these groups under COVID. Instead, the way the mistrust is being characterized, I'm arguing, is, is in a way actually racializing it, arguing that these historical episodes are what makes it difficult uh, for African-American communities specifically to trust uh, the healthcare system. So I'm certainly not arguing that these were not horrific historical episodes, that they do contribute to the attitudes of African-American communities with respect to the healthcare system. But I'm arguing also that the kind of, uh, the, the, the role that these stories are playing also mask uh, the everyday racism that many individual African-Americans and people in uh, these communities continue to uh, experience. And it is the, the local and the daily that I think are important and with we, and I think also the role these stories have played, these three iconic episodes have played, is to turn white pr practitioners' uh, uh, responses into, well, wait a minute, it's not 1850, it's not 1932, and it's not 1950. So we don't do those kinds of things anymore, and therefore the public, particularly African American community, should trust us. Uh, and uh, so trust is playing this sort of dual, double-pronged or multi-pronged role in, in, um, in how the reports of uh, drug, uh, of, I'm sorry, of vaccine, vaccine skepticism uh, 
and hesitancy to uh, use vaccines are being portrayed as part and parcel of what uh, of the response of African American communities. So I think this is, uh, in many respects, unfair. Also, it, in the second point I want to make, and also these stories also mask the broad range of 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 acts of trust, uh, comments about mistrust that occurs in the larger communities in the United States. So the many people in areas of the country who are refusing to wear masks, the many people who are refusing to social distance uh, and to avail uh, or to um, uh, adhere to public health uh, interventions that are being proposed from institutions like the CDC uh, and also uh, expert leaders from the National Institutes of Health. So mistrust to me seems to be something that's very widespread in American culture. No surprise for those of us who study the history of outbreaks of epidemic diseases in this country. Um, and that skepticism though is now being sort of marked in particular ways. I think, uh, and the last point I wanted to make, as the um, vaccines are being uh, prepared uh, for distribution, so rapidly, then it's going to also be important to ask who are the trustworthy, um, trustworthy spokespeople for the efficacy and effectiveness of particular vaccines. We're already beginning to see how those messages are going to be played out. For example, yesterday, three former presidents of the United States agreed to take the vaccine when it's one of the vaccines when they when it's ready in public to demonstrate efficacy and effectiveness. Um, and uh, at the same time, it seems that will engender that that will be a symbol, uh, an episode uh, that represents uh, a certain kind of trust at the top of the um, of American society. It's not clear to me that that will have uh, this, the kind of consequences that people are hoping for in local communities where still today um, the uh, access to um, trustworthy, responsible healthcare is so absent. So thank you. Thank you very much, Evelyn. We've got um, two and a half minutes uh, for discussion in the panel that's not very much but i do want to keep to the limit so that we have time at the end and if it turns out that our audience uh doesn't have many questions we can i'm sure carry on this discussion uh, at sure. that point. um we have the time we have so fellow panelists let's not all shout at once <laughs> does anyone have a... if, can i jump in yes Hi, please I... I, in some ways, it's almost a teaching question, but I, I really appreciate the way you, you know, led with the historical examples, but then suggest that we can't use history as, you know, sort of like a scapegoat or an excuse. How then do you work in history in a kind of a, a nutshell explanation for where we are today. Just I would love to hear your thoughts about that because I think we all deal with those kinds of questions. So no, I think the historical episodes are important, but I think they're, they're first, they're, they're being, in many respects, they're being um, uh, misinterpreted, right? And you know, sort of the kind of details that I would want my students to understand about what happened in the, in the case of James Marion Sims or the Tuskegee syphilis study or even Henrietta Lacks, th those, are getting, those are being flattened out completely. So we're not really dealing with them as the, the, the complex historical episodes that they actually are. They are put together in such a way to, to know um, the persistence of a kind of specific kinds of medical and scientific racism across time. Another important point. At the same time, once you do that, then it seems to me that what 
what is happening in so many of these media discussions is that then those are the sole reasons, right? For the distrust, quote unquote, that all African-Americans have today. And I just think it misses many nuances. It, it flattens out complexity and it doesn't pay attention at, nor emphasize what the, those three episodes really point to deep structural racism in medicine and science. Uh, and they're not just three episodes that we can just pull together. They stand for a much more complex picture and we're not having the conversation about the complex picture. Um, and so I think the history is valuable, but I would like to see it done in a much more rigorous and robust way. And I, I would like people to really pay attention to some um, details uh, that I think are, are important. And, um, and for my students, I certainly hope that it's a, these are uh, noting these episodes is a place to start to understand how systemic racism actually works. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end of the time we have uh, for this particular segment. And it brings us to Ruth Rogowski, who joins us from Vanderbilt University. Uh, she's an expert on China, has written on, on hygiene and, and disease in China. And she's going to talk to us about how public health becomes an element of national identity in pandemic times. Um, and she's going to use the US and China as examples. Ruth. Thank you, uh, Peter, and also thank you to Lisa for organizing the panel for and for AHA personnel for making this possible. I think that a lot of my comments are going to echo what has already been said by my colleagues, and I think we'll ultimately have a really rich discussion. Um, my thoughts, as Peter said, uh, revolve around the question of, of public health pandemics and nationalism, in, in some ways, I think what I'm doing is uh, trying to shine some light on the relationship between epidemics and a nation's international status, focusing on the re relative positions of the United States and China. And I'd like to do so using the historical theme or trope of the sick man. Uh, my first observation is that the pandemic has resulted in a reversal of status between China and the United States in the eyes of many PRC uh, observers. Now, of course, as has already been mentioned, uh, when the coronavirus first emerged about a year ago, observers in the United States castigated China for causing the epidemic through its primitive wet markets. Uh, critics blame the Chinese government for the epidemic. Uh, the Trump administration frequently used the term the China virus to describe COVID. And some US critics of China even resurrected the old phrase, sick man of Asia. Uh, in particular, that was the title of a Wall Street Journal op-ed piece in February, published in February of 2020. And historians know that that phrase was used in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to characterize China as a state so weak that it was unable to defend its citizens from disease or from uh, foreign encroachment. Ironically, now the United States has assumed the sick man mantle. The Chinese government's initial response was, uh, as we're beginning to learn more about, inept. But through dramatic actions such as the 72 day long total lockdown of Wuhan, which uh, is a city that most Americans know nothing about, but it's much larger than uh, New York City. Uh, through the lockdown of Wuhan, uh, China was able to bring the disease under control. Now, in light of the over 275,000 deaths in the United States versus China's fewer than 5,000 deaths, Words about China as a sick man uttered back in February today seem laughable. Indeed, on uh, Chinese social media today, SARS-CoV-2 is called the American virus, while the United States, or sometimes uh, more frequently Trump himself, is habitually referred to as the being fool in Chinese or in English, the sick man. Uh, now, these observations are uh, not particularly 
novel to me, uh, many of my colleagues uh, in the China public health field have, have uh, observed this. Uh, Marta Hansen has recently published on this in uh, Current History. I have a forthcoming piece on this role reversal in the American Journal of Public Health uh, forthcoming uh, this month. Uh, that being said, it's important for us to note that critical voices in China have been silenced. Uh, and in the Q&A, we can certainly talk about that. Nevertheless, I do wanna continue by pointing out that many in China find its nation's performance to control the virus to be a basis for national pride, if not out and out nationalism. And unlike the current US government perspective, China sees its role in international health organizations, the WHO in particular, as a fundamental element uh, of this pride. Uh, I do wanna point out nevertheless that there are clear tensions between the WHO and China. And those tensions between the World Health Organization and China have historical echoes. Uh, it's not talked about that much in US media, but the uh, PRC has limited uh, the WHO COVID investigations. Um, a large scale WHO investigation into the origins of COVID have been in negotiations with China for months and is just being launched now. It's to be led by Chinese scientists with Western scientists reviewing their work virtually. Uh, this mode of trying to keep uh, Western scientists uh, at arm's length echoes episodes of Cold War divisions in particular, during the early 1950s, uh, the PRC accused the United States of using biological weapons in the Korean conflict. Uh, the UN offered to launch an investigation, but instead the PRC turned to the World Peace Council, which is a Soviet-backed international organization. Uh, and the World Peace Council committee traveled to China, but they conducted no investigations. They were in essence, only there as an audience for reports and demonstrations from the Chinese scientists. Uh, today, it's interesting to note, there are no alternative organizations, but the world's nations are still split, uh, even though they have to work now within one global framework. These Cold War scientific nationalisms, uh, which were in some ways developed as a result of this sick man of China, excuse me, sick man of Asia uh, stig stigmatism uh, has now still impacted uh, the ways that the uh, nations of the world may or may not be able to collaborate, especially as the former sick man becomes a leader in world health. Uh, let me just uh, finish by suggesting that even within China, uh, it, echoing uh, some of uh, Evelyn's comments, uh, China's perspective on COVID is starting to reveal certain racialized uh, prejudices. For example, we know that Africans living in Chinese cities have been targeted in COVID roundups, uh, which is an intens intensification of an already present tendency towards racial prejudice in China against those with darker skin color. But more novel, is the fact that people of European descent in a vivid reversal of the sick man trope are now suspect, their blue eyes signaling them as potential carriers of COVID. Uh, to sum up, performance in COVID control is preve and prevention is creating a new ranking of national status in the world, a ranking which, in which the West is vulnerable to assuming the sick man role. Rather than offering an opportunity to rethink our shared humanity, these new dynamics manifest the same fissures of nation and race that will continue to undercut attempts at ensuring human well being. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, fascinating uh, issue. You know, we are all others somewhere, and Europeans were shunned as, as carriers of the disease in India as well. So, uh, uh, taste of our own medicine, as it were. So, three minutes or so fellow panelists. Mark. Yeah, I'd just like to, to ask Ruth um, uh, to, to comment on the role of uh, smaller nations, which have also emerged as being uh, 
you know, potential leaders, in some cases, global leaders, because if you look at the performance of South Korea, for instance, Vietnam, Singapore, even Iceland in, in Europe, I mean, ma many smaller states have actually performed extremely well and have actually uh, gained a, a kind of huge amount of international kudos as a result of what they've, what they've done during the pandemic. So do you think that the emergence of some of these powers, or at least you know the, these smaller states, as um, significant um, polities in terms of public health is going to affect the way in which international health looks over the next decade or so? That's a, that's a great question, Mark. Um, in a nutshell, though, I would say that we have to follow the money and that uh, the US, if, it can, if, it, if with the new administration decides to continue to con contribute and China are going to remain uh, powerhouses because of the cash. Uh, I think the, the one country that you didn't mention, and I'll, I'll be happy to mention it, is Taiwan. And uh, I think obviously politics, uh, global politics continue to, to play a role in the suppression of some of these uh, most, and Taiwan is the most successful state uh, in uh, managing COVID. So um, I would like to think of, I can imagine in some ways maybe South Korea, once again, because of the combination of success and money. Um, but I, I think we're still going to be in a, in a world where the, the superpowers uh, are going to remain dominant uh, for, for better or for worse. But that's a guess of mine as a historian of 19th century China. Thank you. Um, alas, that is more or less the time we have um, allotted. And so I hope we can come back to this in the discussion um, at the end. That brings us um, to Mariola Espinosa, who joins us from the University of Iowa and who's worked on yellow fever in Cuba and more generally on disease in the Caribbean. And she's going to be talking on how scientific knowledge of disease is not stable and the ways in which it can be manipulated for political and economic reasons. And she's also going to be talking about the distinction between social insiders and outsiders and how that is accentuated in pandemics. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you to the organizers and, and to, for giving me the ability to be here among such uh, amazing uh, colleagues, uh, once again, virtually. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. And so what I've been thinking about is a few things that have helped me um, come to terms with what we all are experiencing, but also in the ways uh, in which I explain to my students or to friends, neighbors, family members uh, about what my knowledge uh, provides them some sort, of, um, some sort of understanding of what they're going through. And, and one of the things that I talk about with them is this idea of medical knowledge. Uh, the fact that um, scientific and medical knowledge is always uncertain and is constantly changing over time. And uh, we think of medical scientific discoveries uh, as having a date to them, but it takes time for, for those to be adopted in scientific communities and sometimes don't even replace previous knowledge paradigms and habits. Uh, think, for example, uh, miasma theory and, and cleaning up for yellow fever in Havana or in New Orleans as something that continues on after the discovery of mosquito vectors of disease. Um, and all the fomite cleaning that we did in the early part of the pandemic as we brought our groceries into our homes and cleaned them up, which a lot of people are not doing anymore given the changes in how we understand COVID transmission right now. What that means is that politicians and those with economic interests can also exploit the uncertainty to get the answers that they want. Um, historically, this means that you have uh, slave owners all over the Americas pushing racial immunity arguments uh, for yellow fever, for example, and doctors in port cities saying that the diseases in their cities are not contagious and that in fact that there are no cases of whether it be yellow fever or plague and whatever epidemic is at the time uh, that's threatening that economic uh, vibrancy of those port towns. 
places like Havana, Veracruz, and New Orleans, are, 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 we see that with yellow fever. And we saw that in China as well. We saw that in the United States. Um, we don't quite see it in Puerto Rico as I'm, I'm keeping an eye on that, uh, on that island, that US colony, because it's, it's my home. Uh, so they're doing things a bit different in this neglected colony. Um, in Iowa, there were rumors that COVID uh, was being diagnosed as influenza uh, because politicians were not, um, were not providing testing ability and they were exploiting these ambiguities and symptoms to misdiagnose for political purposes, waiting until after the election of their patrons to enact what we now know as being very insufficient health mask mandates. Um, this is the downplaying of the problem uh, that we saw uh, right out of stories from Rio de Janeiro uh, with smallpox, uh, Veracruz and yellow fever, plague in Mazatlan. Every time that a disease was going to be epidemic, it's downplayed. The other thing is that how this initial reaction to blame outsiders or othering works to reinforce the exclusion of people from communities where they suddenly have become visible and strengthen the boundaries between those who are considered us, part of the nation, and those who are considered them or others. At times when those boundaries might otherwise be questioned, uh, we know that politicians also lay blame on external sources of epidemics as part of this, as Trump had done with China, but not Europe initially, or even Egypt, where the first Iowa cases came from. The misattribution of blame in epidemics is not new. Uh, historian Ana Maria Carrillo has written about Mazatlan and found that Chinese communities there were blamed and targeted for plague in the early 1900s, even though we knew that it was ships coming from San Francisco. And the Sinaloan elites refused to believe that they could have been infected from the United States. That was part of their narrative. It's not the US, it has to be the Chinese. Um, in Havana, I, have, I found records that the Turkish immigrants' homes were the ones that were burned down when there was suspicion of plague. And other, it becomes very racialized, whether it is to describe uh, Blacks as immune when they are not, whether it is to attack non-whites as responsible for infection, even though we know that Blacks and Latina communities are being harder hit by COVID-19 in this country, Speculation about racial differential susceptibility to COVID was evident really early on in the United States when the NBA started reporting asymptomatic cases, right? So this idea that these black athletes somehow are resistant to diseases just like they were to yellow fever. Um, in addition, we've seen these discussions of communities that become visible in times of crisis and concerns about their belonging to the imagined communities of states and nations when Iowans and other Americans refer to COVID as a problem of the meatpacking industry and not of community transmission, it negates the fact that those who work in those locations are members of the community. In Singapore, early on, cases of COVID-19 were observed in migrant worker communities. And so the question remains, will these people continue to be visible and considered part of the nation after these crises are over and provided for? I've run out of time and I have a bunch of other things to talk about that relate to trust, but I'm looking forward to having that conversation as a, as a panel and with the question and answer session. So I hesitate to make huge claims of what we will see, but we can definitely make sense of what's going on now by looking at what has happened before. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we've now had two panelists um, talk extensively about um, race, and I hope that uh, comes up again with a question in the Q&A. Fellow panelists, do you have anything you want to say about what Mariola has been discussing? Uh, Evelyn. Yes, uh, Mariola, I, I'm interested in what you said about uh, how you are talking with people about the ambiguity of medical knowledge. Uh, is it that people are, are in search of certainty, uh, not finding it, uh, what's the expectation of who will provide the, the, the kind of certainty that would, um, you know, assuage uh, or answer the questions of the people you are talking with? Yeah, so it's a really, it's a, it relates to the issue of trust that you brought up, right? So 
Um, it's this idea that that we're being authorities, whether they be political or, or scientific authorities are providing the knowledge about this new disease that we're learning about. And so um, that knowledge, if it changes over time, then becomes suspect, right? So the people who at the beginning of the pandemic are saying, uh, don't wear a mask in the United States, then we're told wear a mask. So, so that change in, um, in policy affects the way people perceive that knowledge, that medical knowledge. Um, the, the fact that people assume or, or expect uh, experts to have all the answers immediately and not have that change over time is something that I've observed. I've also um, have found it a lot easier to teach the history of epidemics and pandemics and to teach that change in knowledge to students who are experiencing a pandemic. And I'm sure the rest of us probably have this experience that, that they understand better this change in scientific knowledge, that this is science that's constantly building up on other people's knowledge. Good, thank you. We have Is there time for another. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much, Mario. I I'm just uh, building on this um, your your remarks about the exploitation of uncertainty and looking at one of the questions uh, from the from the audience. Um, I wonder if we might think also more about the. The, the, the way in which this moment is is different in a way from past moments in the sense that so much data is available that everybody can become their own epidemiologist or think they're their own epidemiologist and, and can in, you know interpret that data and use it to really create a world that they want to believe in you know uh, um, and so um and you know, just like we're, you know, it's the kind of um, medical web, you know, M MD situation, right? Where, where, where we can think we can all become doctors by, by you know, searching on the web. Um, and I'm wondering, yeah, if, if you see a, 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 dis a, a difference here in, the, in this particular moment, given the kind of availability of information, the, 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 the massive amounts of information that are available in terms of how that uncertainty um, is exploited compared to past epidemics. I, I think it has a different nature to it in that um, the, the information that's available to us, it's available to a, a larger portion of the population, right? Through social media and, and it's accessible to a larger portion of the population. And it's instantaneous, right? So like, it's not something that gets published in a journal and eventually gets shipped overseas to somebody's office and they can read it, um, which is the you know, 19th century version of the intellectual exchange, right? Um, so so the, the speed of information and misinformation is, is something that I, I have a hard time kind of coming to grips with myself, right? In, in how I understand that change over time when I look at the past, it's been expanded, right? So now it's like really fast. The speed of what we're going through is, is striking to me. And those are some of the differences that I do see um, that, that, you know, anything can be online, whether it's peer reviewed or not. Whereas before you would get a trickle of information and depending on what your community was, you would get different types of it. Thank you. That um, brings us to the end of our of our time for this segment and to the final segment, uh, which is going to be presented by M Mark Harrison, who joins us from Oxford and who's worked on military medicine in Britain and on disease spread uh, via commerce. And he's going to talk about resistance to public health attempts in this pandemic and uh, why it arises at particular times and in certain places. Mark. Uh, th thank you, Peter, and thanks also to, to Lisa and the AHA staff for arranging all of this. Um, as Peter said, I want to talk primarily about resistance and protest. These are both very problematic terms, it has to be said, but I don't really have the, the, the kind of time to really go into that. But one of the reasons I want to talk about this is because this is also something I've been considering, not simply as a historian since the beginning of the pandemic, but also as a 
as a policy advisor for the, the UK government, and this has been one of the, the things I've been um, particularly involved in. And so what's clear to me is that in this context of policy advice and policy making, that history does have a really important role. And I think I'd just like to preface my remarks by just saying what I think that is. I think right at the beginning of the, the pandemic, one of the, the most important things um, really was that we, to observe really about the role of the historian is that there was very little else to go on when in terms of trying to think through particularly the way people are likely to behave in the context of a pandemic other than history. There were, at that time, uh, there was, you know, very, very little data. So history had a really important role at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, partly for that reason. But certainly as the pandemic has progressed, uh, then it, it's very clear that people have responded both to the disease and also to the ways in which governments have intervened to try to control the pandemic in ways which reflect their, their there's obviously their, their social conditions, the relationships they have with other communities, with government and with the police, and of course all those things, as, as Ivan and others have pointed out, are things which are kind of historically produced. And the third thing which is really important is that as governments think about different policy interventions at different points in the pandemic or epidemic, if you think about an individual country, then you can really draw on historical analogies, bring that together with behavioral science to try to get a sense of how people are likely to react to certain kinds of intervention. And the kind of the, the predictions, if you like, that we make are not always accurate, but they, they are certainly better than 50% accurate. And so I think historians have an important role to play in that too. So uh, my role has been mostly talking about um, or advising on issues relating to, to policing, security, crime, and one aspect of that is resistance and protest. The first thing to, to note really from a historical point of view is that although we tend to think of epidemics as great crises, which often produce uh, political tumult, on the whole, as Samuel Cohn has pointed out in his recent book, that is not the case. It's the, on the whole, epidemics tend to produce mutual aid, acts of compassion, and most people where public health measures are, exist do actually adhere to them on the whole. But nevertheless, uh, particularly in this pandemic, we've seen quite a lot of evidence of social unrest in many countries around the world. That unrest has resulted partly as a result of the failure of governments to intervene, sometimes as a result of the failure of governments to, uh, to provide economic aid for those people who are quarantined and isolated and so forth. But also, of course, the, the the interventions that governments have made have also led to um, kind of resistance, and some, sometimes that's been quite violent. And we've seen that in many European countries and also other parts of the world. So this, this kind of civil disorder has ranged from, in some cases, sabotage and attacks on symbolic targets through to rioting. But on the whole, most of the resistance, as in previous epidemics, has really been what might be termed everyday resistance. So evasion of isolation, breaking quarantine, refusal to comply with social distancing, or of course, mask wearing, no. Um, and this really, as I say, fits the pattern of most epidemics where resistance is really on the whole of that kind. Now, the three main causes of resistance, I would say in the current pandemic also have historical precedents. I mean, the first is that most resistance, particularly the everyday forms of resistance, result as a, a really from the practical difficulties of adhering to restrictions, particularly among people on low income groups, in low income groups. That you might not say is necessarily resistance, this could be just practical difficulties, but that's a sort of gray area. Uh, the second, which is definitely a form of resistance, is that. Um, there's a some, it usually happens when there's a sense that public health measures are disproportionate to the threat. As people, this is a perception, of course, not necessarily a reality. So this would involve concerns about the loss of civil liberties, 
or economic damage uh, done by public health interventions. You can see these themes, of course, in many anti-lockdown protests today in different parts of the world. Historically, you can see these things emerging in opposition to quarantine in Europe and in, in, in the Americas in the 18th and 19th century. The third thing is really a sense that measures which are taken are unfair in that they are maybe targeted towards certain groups or maybe inadvertently reinforce class, ethnic and generational injustice. So historically, there are you know, many examples we could think of where um, there have been rioting from working class groups or ethnic minorities which have felt themselves persecuted in the context of epidemics. And today, you can see at many parts of the world, obviously in, in the case of low income groups who feel disadvantaged by measures such as quarantine and isolation, for instance, Dalit migrant workers in India, many um, uh, many ethnic minority groups in European countries in the US feel the same way. So those are the three main causes of resistance in the current pandemic and also have precedence in others. The third point I'd like to make is really what triggers, um, what makes low level resistance into serious disorder. And I say here, there are really two main triggers. And one is concurrent crisis. In other words, where epidemics become entangled with other powerful political dynamics or significant events. So for instance, in the current pandemic, that could include BLM and also counter protests in the US and the UK. It could include uh, anti-globalism in, in, in the anti-lockdown protests. Historically, of course, resistance to epidemics very often was sort of bound up with colonial resistance movements, struggle for political representation, uh, racial justice and so forth. The second main trigger is actually poor policing. Um, poor policing uh, where relations between police and soldiers and communities are historically poor especially can elevate what's a relatively small altercation or street violence into rioting. We see this you know in many cases today throughout Europe, Paris, Serbia, and other places, but historically in places like Hong Kong with plague in 1894, also with plague in, in Bombay in 1896. So those are my main reflections. Um, and you can see that in some ways, the main themes, the patterns of protests that we see today are very similar to those with historical epidemics and pandemics. But of course, there are also some some very distinctive features. And I think I've probably run out of time, so I can talk about those later in the discussion. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes for panelists' responses. Colleagues? Ruth? There's actually something that I thought of in some of my emails uh, with Peter in preparation for our discussion. Um, so I live in a red state, very red. And um, what struck me is that while there's plenty of grumbling, everyone who goes into Walmart wears a mask. Uh, and everyone in the Dollar General in the very small rural town in East Tennessee uh, that I've traveled to, that I've been traveling to to get away from from Nashville. Uh, I'm curious in your thinking, it's focused on government policy, but what strikes me is, is at least in the United States that business policy has shaped the everyday experiences of so many people from employees to consumers. And at least in my anecdotal, very limited experience, there's been more of a willingness to go along with the business policies than, than, than policies that seem to be dealt by the hand of the government. I'm just curious if, if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I think our remarks probably, you know, reflect, you know, the, you know, our different countries really, because, you know, here the decision to, I mean, the, um, the decision to make mask wearing compulsory within stores and other public areas was really a government decision rather than a, a decision taken by the private sector. But I think, I think the private sector will actually create quite an important dynamic in terms of 
public health in the UK and maybe uh, and many other countries over the next um, the next few months, really, as a result of uh, the introduction of vaccination, um, and particularly uh, with certification or so-called health passports, I think it's really going to be in some countries. I think particularly the UK, it's going to be the private sector that's really um, pushing that, and I think it will probably start off with entrance to large events like you know football and, and other big sporting events. And then maybe it will be pick, picked up by, by some big retail outlets and that type of thing. And gradually it will spread and, and it may, may become the norm. So then the interesting thing is that what role then does should, should the government have? I mean, should the government, you know, in order to maybe um, prevent people from being disadvantaged, to go about the, to, do, to do the things that are really important to them, you know, the things they not they habitually do, or regard as their right, things like doing certain kinds of shopping, for instance. Should the government intervene then to legislate against um, the use of um, certification in certain private private businesses? This is this would be quite unprecedented. So I think we're we're moving into new territory, certainly, and I think that maybe what's happened in the US with the, the private sector creating the dynamic could soon, soon start to happen in a, in a slightly different way in other countries like our own here. Good, thank you. Um, we've run out of time for the panelists as such, uh, and we're now in the, in the half hour allotted to the general discussion. You can all see the questions submitted so far by the audience. Um, there are two substantive ones. Uh, you right, everyone can see this. There are two substantive ones that deal uh, with race slash ethnicity and then with information. And so, I suggest. Um, I mean, we can all read the question uh, from Christopher Willoughby. Um, I'm not quite sure the issue about testing uh, COVID in Africa is. Um, racist or even pertinent because I think if I understand the logic is you have to go somewhere where there is actually a raging epidemic in order to test a vaccine and so they have gone to places like Brazil and the US uh, precisely to do this, the same and probably wouldn't go to Africa at the moment because there isn't enough of an epidemic there to make it worthwhile but be that as it may the question that's raised is more general one about ethnicity and race, and I wonder if we want to tackle that. Is there, I mean, if someone wants to tackle the specifics of that question, that's fine, um, but more generally, um, I suppose the question is, imagine just for the sake of discussion that there is some connection between incident susceptibility, um, uh, you know, the course of the disease and ethnicity or race. Um, is that sort of off the table in terms of scientific discussion or how do we handle that? Well, I think I think part of what's happening when 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 we start talking about um, how how the impact of COVID on um, the disproportionate impact of COVID on um, on uh, communities of color in the U.S. There's always going to be, you know, um, the invocation of the issue that there must be some fundamental and innate differences between Black bodies, Brown bodies, and uh, and bodies of people who are always other. Uh, and and I think that 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 undercurrent is always there and it, and what it uh, and 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 what it does and what it achieves is is to distract people from the um, structural systemic issues that the pandemic has revealed um, and so I, I don't necessarily uh, suggest that there's not going to be variable individual responses to any kind of virus but I don't think that and, and in bio, in biological terms but I don't think that um, that the way we can talk about that um, is 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 clear enough that doesn't allow for uh, 
um, the point I'm trying to make of the ways in which it can it can distract from looking at the other systemic issues. Okay. It strikes me that one of the interesting things about what we've discovered about the COVID, about this uh, particular pandemic is, in a sense, we're all minorities now, in the sense that if you, if, if the disease strikes particularly people with various other factors that make them more susceptible, factors like, you know, heart disease and obesity and that sort of thing, the percentage of the population that has one of these issues is in fact, you know, close to half, if not even more than that. And it's, you know, the older, richer uh, uh, the population is, the more likely it is to have one of these issues. So in a sense, you know, what we're discovering is that we are all especially susceptible, or many of us. And I wonder to what extent that sort of undermines the scapegoating of particular other groups defined in other terms. All right, if you don't like that. I, I, Mari, I, I think I'll, I'll jump that. on that. I mean, I, I would say that, yes, we all may be susceptible, but our abilities to um, reduce exposure is is hugely differential, right? And so who are the people that are, you know, in essential, in, in essential job services, for example, um, that have to be out every day um, versus those of us that, you know, are able to sit here and Zoom um, for our profession, right? I mean, so that there's there's huge differentials um, in terms of vulnerabilities of exposure, um, even though we all may be susceptible, right? And and even may patterns where it's you know an aging demographic where there are these comorbidities that exist that have higher susceptibility to, for example, hospitalization. And, and it goes alongside the, the social determinants of health. We can't, we can't eliminate that from the populations that we're seeing as, as having the highest incidence. Um, in addition is access to better health care, right? So it would be um, more socially uh, upper class people who have access to some of the experimental drugs and can go into a hospital, get, get <laughs> the care um, that's different than the care that people with lesser access to their, um, to healthcare. Let me try a question that ties together what I see as two of the main themes that we've been discussing. On the one hand, race, ethnicity, and on the other, um, trust, compliance, uh, how people go along. So somebody uh, suggested that, you know, a lot of smaller nations have done quite well. And if you look at the list of small nations, of course, another factor about them is that they all, all tend to be, if not islands, then at least peninsular, um, like South Korea. So that they're sort of able to isolate themselves, you know, Iceland, uh, New Zealand, um, and, and Australia on a slightly bigger scale. They're able to isolate themselves. But another uh, factor that distinguishes those nations that have done best is the fact that they're also, um, they tend to be ethnically homogenous and they certainly have a kind of cultural homogeneity. If you look at the situation in Sweden, um, where they prided themselves precisely on their ability not to have to have the state intervene and to allow people to do what they wanted, the whole premise was that, well, Swedes know what to do. Well, you know, that raises the obvious question, all Swedes, how did they learn this? And the answer, of course, is, you know, the nice white Swedes who were raised in the country knew what to do. And the ones who didn't know what to do were the you know, recent immigrants, and especially Somalis, uh, among whom the, the disease you know, ravaged. And so the question is, are nations, who, who are the compliant nations? Where, where have the governments not had to go in and bang heads? If you look at the Blavatnik uh, measure of the firmest, where the countries that have imposed the firmest rules, you know, they, they all tend to be in, in, in the third world in Latin America, 
not in the, in the first world. Um, they're countries, in a sense, that knew they had to protect the, um, uh, their health system, uh, such as it was, by clamping down and not letting the epidemic um, spread. So, you know, there it's not so much a question of compliance, but in the, in the first world and in Asia, the whole issue of compliance rests to some extent on a kind of homogeneity, maybe not, maybe not ethnic, but certainly cultural homogeneity that people do what they're expected to do and don't have to have their heads banged together by police officers. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot in what you're saying there, um, and I, you know, I've talked, you know, having talked to uh, people who live in some of the countries that we've just discussed, and I think, you know, that, that you know, they say that, you know, clearly they have certain advantages. Sometimes they, you know, they, they are they are affluent countries. They they are maybe, you know, have a very very good technological industrial base and so on and so forth. But when it comes down to it, the way in which people behave and the feeling of responsibility that they have to each other is really, really important um, in adherence to things like isolation and giving contact details and so on. So you can have a really high, really highly sophisticated technical system, but it could break down if there wasn't that kind of homogeneity. And this is actually things that people are saying to me in, in, you know, in South Korea and, and some other contexts. But there are some exceptions, and you know there are some countries where, you know, the um, where which have been quite really quite successful in dealing with coronavirus. And we the, the countries we don't really normally talk about in that context, which are in a, another category completely, and they will include quite a few of the Middle Eastern countries, particularly the Gulf states, for instance, Oman, UAE, places like that. They managed to the control coronavirus really quite um, quite well, but they obviously places too which have incredibly large migrant populations, and where the, the kind of the indigenous population, say of UAE, is really a, you know much smaller proportionally than the migrant labour workforce, and you know to a lesser extent the same is also true of Oman and many of the other Gulf states. But what obviously makes the difference there is that. Uh, a, those people do not have citizenship rights, and B, they are tightly controlled. Uh, these are, you know, whatever measure you use, these are, you know, fairly authoritarian countries. Um, so, you know, that's a, again a sort of another category of, of country, if you like, which has, you know, has been you know, relatively successful at dealing with this, and and I think also because of the obviously because of the financial clout of countries like UAE will probably, they will be able to, to kind of use this in terms of their, their sort of regional and indeed to some extent global ambitions to kind of project their power, their soft power, as well as their hard power over the next decade or so. But, you know, but Mark, I, I, I take your point and I, I, I think I understand your question, Peter, but at the same time, I think sort of, you know, th there is some real tension between, you know, what um, can be done when, what, when, when a nation state evokes uh, 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 the, the idea that cultural homogeneity is at, uh, you know, represents a kind of commitment to unity that has strong bonds. Whereas in the US, what we had or, uh, were, was a leadership that was actually using the heterogeneity of our country as a way to divide people for political reasons to not respond to what was being uh, suggested by public health and medical authority. So it seems to me that the role of the government, government itself, in, uh, in some, if, if we had had a leader, I'll put it this way, if we had a leader, a, a leadership at the time in, in January that argued that we should respond to this in the United States, in, in terms of trying to have communities take care of each other, right? To evoke a sense of, 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 of community, it seems to me the responses would have been profoundly different than what we got, which was it, a really dog whistles that said, if you are white and you live in a hyper segregated area and there are no black people in your neighbor, in your gated community, you don't have to worry about COVID, right? because those people with it aren't in your neighborhood. Uh, and so they were using 
the fact that we have uh, hyper segregated communities, that we have the kind of structural inequalities that the pandemic revealed to divide uh, people and to create a sense that it wasn't something, that COVID is not something that could be addressed effectively by calling on a sense of community. And it seems to me in other nations where this notion of ethnic homogeneity, homogeneity is important, uh, that they can, they can manipulate that um, as well to, uh, to, to try to, in, in one sense, control responses to the outbreak. Can I jump in here? Uh, I, I, it's a, this is a fascinating question and I do see that there's a few questions in the Q&A about uh, authoritarian minded governments versus um, others. Uh, what I would love to hear everyone talk a bit more about, particularly Greg though, um, so with regard to China, one might say, oh, it's, you know, homogeneous. I mean, even just saying that sentence coming out of my mouth is just, it's anathema. Uh, I mean, people from Wuhan, I mean, regional differences are, can be extreme and map high onto ethnic or even racial differences elsewhere. So people from Wuhan were, you, if you were a itinerant worker from Wuhan trying to make a living in Tianjin, you could be run out of town. Uh, violently uh, chased away because of your regional identity. Uh, there are ways that all societies label and, and separate their, their, their people uh, that don't necessarily make sense to Americans, um, but that are visceral and real in other societies. And so uh, if a leader evokes homogeneity, I, I, you know, it's 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 a, an artifice. It's a it's a political move. Um, so uh, so to to claim homogeneity is is a falsehood. Um, and and with regard to people going along with a uh, with with government dicta it's um or or not resisting uh, I, I i would hesitate greatly to to chalk it up to cultural cultural warm and fuzzy blankets uh in china of course it's uh as much uh, a realization of the the um the uh uh the the the, the uselessness of trying to resist because of the immense power of the state that can come down upon you. And it's, it coexists with a leadership that has been since day one saying we're all in this together. So Evelyn's point about if, if the voice at the top is different, uh, the reaction of society might be diff different as well. But the, these two things of, of authoritarian power and, and uh, a, presentation of cultural uh, wholeness can go hand in hand. Shall we try another theme? I, I see that Justin Martinez uh, raises an interesting question of information and that of course has been one of the unusual aspects about this particular pandemic. Um, in a good sense, you know, an extraordinary outpouring of scientific research, all in in preprint, on the on the web somewhere, posted somewhere on the web, um, scientific information that allowed the uh, DNA of the virus to be decoded in weeks rather than months, as it was with the last pandemic. So, you know, it's an extraordinary openness. Um, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, of course, you know, a riot of misinformation as well. So. Any of you want to tackle this question, which I think we can sum up as saying, is there such a thing as too much information or too much bad information? Or you know, how, how do we start getting our heads around that? I guess that's uh, where um, we fall into our skills as historians, where we are thinking of teaching our students on how to evaluate sources, right? So, um, 
I, I hope that that students that go through our classrooms are able to to face the the barrage of information they're getting um, with the tools of analysis to try to figure out um, whether something has been peer reviewed, whether it's coming from voices that um, perhaps not the usual voices in this occasion, um, but voices that 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 have some sort of um, evidence of being trustworthy, right? Um, and it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to do right now when we're talking about so much information being available in all these preprints. But I think that um, that really kind of tapping into uh, the knowledge of others and trusting, for example, like I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist, but but I know to trust them and to be able to read that literature and, and understand it and incorporate it into my own studies of of history, right? So. So um, historians, um, we've been trained to be single authors, but we really should be interdisciplinary and kind of listen to what other people are saying and trust. Um, so so that, that line keeps on coming, that, that word trust keeps on coming. So it's, it's something that I think that we just need to keep on working on trying to figure out um, who's publishing it, what's their motivation, what is their evidence? Is it something that I should listen to? But I also I'd think like we have, we've been kind of uh, in a context since January uh, with a, with um, a barrage of a, a context that's been shaped by a barrage of comments that suggest that, that emphasizes fake news. What constitutes and what has constituted the fake news and what has constituted uh, uh, what we used to call established scientific authority. And I don't know if I would call it that anymore because it's all of that seems to have been destabled. Um, and, and it's hard to say the CDC has been undermined as, an, as a stable author, authoritarian voice. People at the National Institutes of Health, uh, individuals, different doctors, different public health experts, and then a lot of misinformation. So I think the context here is identifying, you know, what constitutes the voice of quote unquote the facts and even the notion of facts has been destabilized uh, in this moment. And so uh, I do think social media has played a role in speeding up the, the proliferation of all of that um, into the, 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 into the, the, into the American culture. I, I wonder too if I, there was another dimension of that question and in, that asked about, you know, where can we look to where uh, as, as examples of where people are relieving the situation and, and it, it ties to a, a remark of Marx that I was really interested in in that, you know, historically we have seen in the emergence of uh, groups, you know, in that context. And it, it seems to me that um, there hasn't been enough coverage of that, um, you know, locally within, with, you know, in, in communities. I mean, I live in a, a, a very rural area um, in, in Wisconsin um, where all, all these mutual aid kind of relationships have developed in terms of local food markets and so forth. and um you know in response um certainly you know in the ebola outbreak in west africa where you have you know not the kind of hyper individualized culture that we see in american society but you know a, a much uh communities much more focused around the we than me um there you know the way in which people villages kind of drew on historical memory and the way in which they dealt with strangers uh, during the war to create their own um, local, um, you know, locally isolated and, 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 and supported each other through that. Um, so we, you know, there is a lot of focus on, you know, resistance, um, but it seems to me that we really need uh, also be to be attentive to how these kind of acts of mutual aid are are arising and you know throughout the different geographic areas that that we work in um, 
uh, in a response to that. Yeah, I think that's important. I think, you know, also as historians, we we have also been guilty of, you know, a lot of selection bias. And we've kind of, when we've looked at epidemics, we've tended to go for conflict, <laughs> acts of resistance primarily, for a whole range of reasons. Um, but I think, you know, this is, I think it probably, as, as far as the, the current situation is concerned, I think there are probably quite some important national differences. I think in some countries, mutual aid does actually get maybe more coverage, possibly than it does in the US. Um, but I think one of the, there's an interesting lesson to be learned here. And I think not just in relation to pandemics, but in, in responses to all kinds of emergencies actually, where you very often find mutual aid emerging almost or, or sort of organically uh, on the basis of pre-existing networks, just like the ones that you've described. Um, is that for the people who are responding to that, who come in, it could be the, the police, the emergency services, the armed forces in some cases, that it's very often better to, to bolster the forms of mutual aid that exist, the organic ones, rather than to try to replace them according to some pre-planned pre uh, emergency response scenario. Um, and it's, you know, certainly I think it is often more effective in terms of the, the, the kind of the response at the time, but also in terms of the kind of the legacy of the intervention, I think it could actually can have a very positive impact on a community if you kind of validate what the community is already doing and assist it rather than then simply say, say, okay, you know, you've done your bit, step aside and we'll, the professionals will get on with it. I think that you can see that, I think in the COVID pandemic, you know, there's been some good examples where, you know, um, and it clear, clearly government has, governments have recognized that and worked with communities and, and other cases where the two are, are really just doing things in tandem. And very often, of course, mutual aid emerges where, you know, governments haven't done much. <laughs> so that's kind of almost inevitable. It's, a, it's like filling a vacuum. But I think one of the lessons is that, you know, really for all sort of future emergencies is to, is to try to work with mutual aid where, where it exists. Colleagues, we have like a, a minute and a half left. Is there anything weighing you down that you want to get off your chest before we wrap up or finish? Are there any of the questions um, that we haven't touched on specifically that you feel need addressing that we should give a last whack before we sign off? Uh, I wanted to ask Greg about, um, I know you noted uh, in some of our discussions before about epidemics ending. Um, how do you think about the end? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, there was a, there was a question, you know, we didn't address HIV uh, in, in this discussion and, you know, um, has that, you know, has that, epidemic of HIV AIDS ended. I mean, there's a sense within the media and so forth that it has, right? But if we look at the number of people affected by HIV AIDS, um, US, Africa, you know, worldwide, um, the numbers wouldn't suggest that. Um, so when is it, how is it that societies desi decide when an epidemic is ended, right? And, and I think we'll see in the context of COVID that, um, you know, once vaccines are available, pr provided they're effective, um, we're able to kind of move about in the world again that, you know, there'll be a declaration that the, the epidemic is ended. But um, what about the long-term economic and, and, and social um, issues that endure? Um, so, so how do we, you know, is it a biological, how do we constitute an ending? Is it a biological, right? Is it when the epi curve is done or, you know, how, how does it continue on in society? I think it's a really uh, interesting question. That, if I may say, was a perfect way of ending. <laughs>
not for epidemic, but this panel um, right on time um, and with the sort of an open end um, toward the future, which we regard, I think, rather more optimistically today than you know a month ago, thanks to various recent scientific uh, breakthroughs and developments. So panelists, thank you very much. I'm not quite sure how it works technically, um, whether our friends of the AHA have long since cut off recording and broadcasting or, <laughs> and we're just sort of, you know, spinning our wheels here and <laughs> amongst ourselves or, or how it works or whether we now have to sort of, you know, all take a bow and, um, and shut down. Oh, there we go, here we go. The, the genius behind the scenes can tell us. Yes, um, well, I just want to thank all of our uh, panelists for joining us today, um, and we'll try to send you a copy of the Q&A so we can answer some of the questions we didn't quite get to during the live seminar. Um, and express gender uh, thanks again to our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.